In Wizard 101, there were spells added to the second arc called Astral Spells, which involved the Sun, Star, and Moon school. Each of them have their respective uses. For Sun, it's to enchant a card to make it more powerful. For Star, it's to have an overtime buff around you. And for Moon, it's to be a third wheel. Well, the closest definition I can give you for the Moon School is that you can shapeshift. Now, polymorphs are essentially the ability to morph into a different creature besides a human. In this case, you morph into a weaker version of yourself because polymorphs literally have no redeeming qualities whatsoever. You're better off becoming a skinwalker than morphing into one of these creatures. So let me break it down. When you use a polymorph spell, you waste one turn, which is the equivalent of getting stunned or skipping your turn in Yu-Gi-Oh. Some polymorphs actually have resistances. Not all of them though. But get this, you also get boosted in that form. What this means is you'll take extra damage from the opposing school, such as fire the ice or vice versa. Then, on top of everything, you get stripped of your critical and your critical block. Yes, I'm not kidding. To paraphrase Willy Wonka, you get fucking nothing. You lose when you polymorph into this. Now that I have your mighty morphing dream shattered, it's time to see how things turned out. Celestia was a world once ruled by robots and their overlord bulbous big-brained aliens that inhabited this underwater space kingdom. Time passed and along with it came enemies who sought control for power in Celestia. The world was divided up by five factions. The sharks, underground mole people, the lobotomites, dog people that own dogs for some reason, and worst of all, the soft shell crabs. You know, Fallout was right in saying war never changes, or at least in the last two Wizard 101 worlds it hasn't. Now scavengers, prospectors, and adventurers all flock to uncover the ruins that is Celestia. Maybe there is evil afoot. Or maybe it's just the daily lives of creatures in the universe. The first thing I did to become the next ruler of Celestia was to hatch the beast that will aid me in my endeavor. Which just so happens to be a raccoon that morphs you into a cat for some odd reason. Why you may ask? Because I'm underleveled and we can't fight barefisted. Wizardry has certain standards, just like Hogwarts. Luckily I mixed it with a tiger and got back a raccoon. The next thing I did was pick up the cloak spell from the PvP horse unicorn thing. Don't ask why a PvP spell can't be used in PvP, I, I don't get it either. Now you might say, but Hunter, you can't do that because it's not a sun spell when it's enchanted. While it may be true, but at the point when you cast it, it actually turns into a sun spell. There are limits to the cloak spell though, such as healing. You can't hide a heal, but you can cloak a shield, trap, or blade. Or really any buff for that matter. Basically, this is what I have to start with. It ain't much, but it's also not honest work. To begin, I talked to Ambrose about sending a kid to an unknown war-torn undersea world. I took my first steps into Celestia with my trusty seahorse and met Edith, who told me about the ongoing soft-shell crab problem. Apparently, it was difficult to boil the crabs, and they believed the key to do so was locked behind three power stones, each bearing the name of the Astral Schools. Without further delay, I went into the Celestian Sleep Deprivation Chamber. Here, all the dog residents do their best work, which is stand around doing nothing all day, like everybody else in the spiral. Here, I met Dolly Prosciutto, who told me to complete various tasks, like conducting a survey on how the residents were feeling. They sure were feeling the crabs though. Next, I collected toilet paper off the ground because the locals were in dire need of something to wipe their ass with. You see, the underwater lifestyle is tough and the transition process is rigorous. The next thing I did was collect crab meat by boiling them alive. Luckily, the crabs did not resist much at all and I only came out of it with minor wounds. I fixed some of the plumbing in the chamber and went back to Dolly. He asked me to find a local resident that had disappeared. So me being the best detective there ever was, played a bit of Blue's Clues, except this was neither fun nor Blue, not even the board game Clue. After finding a crab testicle, I brought it back to Dolly. He said it was a watch belonging to a resident that got kidnapped by crabs. I boiled some hard shell crabs in order to obtain a key to the top of the tower. Even though they resisted, there really isn't anything I could have used. 
At the tower, I had met my match, a crab called Optio Algae. It had a harder exterior than any other I've come across so far. Not only did they have defense, but offense to boot. Oh, and critical, because that's a thing now. Also, being underleveled did not help my current situation. After getting a taste of my own medicine in the melting pot over and over, I thought if I took one of them down before I went down myself, it would have been a little bit easier. And you know what? It wasn't. It was at this point I realized I wasn't strong enough to win against two stale old crabs. And like any other anime protagonist, I backtracked and trained harder by literally earning training points for spells I needed. The reason why is because I need something to cloak with, otherwise it was useless. In the end though, it was worth it to taste the sweet juices of victory with my very own critical. After this ordeal, it was time to go inside Celestia's toilet hole, known as the Grotto. In search of the first stone, I talked with the mechanical dogfish named Rupert. He told me how he got his ass beat by crabs and thrown into this makeshift jail cell. I was then tasked to collect clues from crabs because of curiosity. You know what they say, curiosity killed the crab. After about half an hour of trying to collect clues like collecting pocket change off the ground, I was asked by Rupert to collect coral to make blue number no. 5 semi-gloss lipstick. It was to make sure he'd look good for crabs in his mini prison. Apparently, the stone I needed all along was in a cave, so I went deeper. All the fish here were trying to play follow the leader, but none of them could do it. I went and solved the puzzle and collected the stone, but sadly, this was only half of it. Next, instead of collecting clues, it was information now. What the fuck is the difference? Is it clues or information? Which is it? After boiling some more crabs alive, I went back to Rupert with information on my new crab rangoon recipe. And also, most importantly, where the other half of the stone was being kept. Unfortunately, a naked Patrick Star covered the entrance to the building, so I needed to find a way to remove him. Luckily though, another crab by the name of Optio Mistletoe knew how to do so. I confronted him in my cat form and was killed more than 9 times. It's a myth to say cats have 9 lives because the truth is, they either have 1 or more than 9. In my case, I think we're up to 20 lives. I like to think that it got rejected from the gates of heaven so it got sent back to earth to relive hell. That's probably why it keeps dying over and over. When the stars, sun, and moon all aligned though, I was able to take this crab down. As it turns out, Patrick liked algae. So the only way to get algae, which you obviously can't pick up from the background, no, that's that's illegal. You gotta get it from old crab men. Anyways, after a long fought battle of RNG and crabs, I was able to collect all the algae needed to proceed with my quest. Inside the starfish hut, I met this little mini pocket crab who wanted to pick a fight with me. After a couple tries, I bullied him into submission. While he cried his eyes out, I collected the second half of the stone. I returned to Edith with stone in hand and was given the cold shoulder when I found out the stone wasn't to unlock Celestian magic, but rather another area. I met with Thornberry at the district of the sharks and he informed me of the shark villagers trying to rebuild the monolith so that they may worship their new god, me. Chaos and disorder had arrived. No need to worship, just pray. Sadly, they didn't pray hard enough and was bulldozed for the most part. After showing my followers their wrongdoing, I began to restore the monolith myself because the sharks couldn't bother to do it. They really couldn't do anything besides run laps in circles. In the district, I needed to find a way to restore access to the main building because that is where the first stone is held. To do so, I did various tasks such as extracting energy from robotic husks, learning the history of the portal cube, observing a celestian pentagram, beating up sharks for their lunch money, did not collect mosaic tiles from Piscean troopers, try again, and many more. After viewing a broken down merry-go-round and looking back at my life choices so far, I went back to Thornberry. He informed me that the key to get into the main building was through the shark leader named Etu Brute. I will admit this took over 20 minutes of back and forth action and a ton of guzzling potions. However, one thing I did discover is sharks don't usually travel in packs, so after one goes down, the other tends to stay down permanently. Another thing I did was take time to upgrade my arsenal, to mighty morph into a creature who could cut through shields with ease, and the only one who could do so was Heat Blast. 
With it being a one-on-one -on -one PvP style match now, I had the upper hand and was able to swiftly take him down. Inside the main building known as the Solarium, I saw some robots breakdancing. One of them proceeded to call me out by saying I couldn't dance. I tangled with them and showed them who really had two left feet. It wasn't me, it was the cat. The only one who could keep up though was my storm dinosaurd. It was curtains for him, but in the end, he still had shit to say. After solving a preschool puzzle, I was on my way to the main room of the Stellarium. Here I confronted Succotash Skywalker, a ghost who died because he failed to obtain the username of Skywalker instead. For this tough battle, I morphed into the Ice Dinosaurd, who could tack heavy hits. Although he doesn't have any outgoing damage, for some odd reason, he was able to knock some sense into Skywatcher and sent him packing to the sky where he belonged. I don't know man, this doesn't look like the Star of Celestia to me, but whatever. Regardless, I picked it up and went back to Edith. She informed me with her happy psycho smile that power was within her grasp. Now I needed parts for a diabolical machine to access the secrets of Celestia. I was sent to the upper echelon of high society known as the Floating Island, where a dogman named Pierce told me about the relations between the underground mole people and the local dog residents. I really didn't give a shit, I just needed parts, but I needed them to be on good terms. So I did various things, such as destroy faceless tsunami monsters, getting destroyed by faceless tsunami monsters, taming a wild pack of wolves that terrorized the residents, and me with their criticals. So much so, after being defeated by them, I decided to take the piss of frustration. And when I came back from the bathroom, I received the middle finger salute, known as the Ghost and Goblins Easter Egg, called Do the Whole Boss Battle All Over Again. Now with Minion too. I gotta go all the way back to Celestia manually. The Ghost and Goblins Easter Egg works in mysterious ways. Relations were now on the up and up now that the wolves were gone. I met with the short tribal leader and was told I'd have to beat some sense into some trees. Before I could be the lumberjack I always knew I was, I went to the shopping district and bought myself some sturdy clothing. You see, I realized that if I was ever gonna have any chance of surviving powerful hits, I needed some resistances in my base form. With my new ragtag hobo style clothing, I set my sights to chop down the deformed googly eyed trees. Always bring fire to a tree fight, because that's how you start a wildfire and win. After beheading the tree, I was now friends with the underground mole people. This allowed me to speak with the residential expert of Bikini Bottom, the bane of season 4 and after Spongebob, known as the Spirit of Squidward. He spoke only in gibberish and slurred speech, but from the time I spent chatting with him, he seemed to want me to set fire to more trees. I did his bidding and he gestured me towards where I could find the parts I needed. I returned to Edith and received cards I couldn't use and was told to help out people over in the storm drains. In the storm drains, I learned plumbing 101 by fixing water pumps and collecting trash off the ground. I beat up some bulb-headed delirious ghosts with heat blast in order to obtain crystals. The crystals supposedly supplied power to the residents here. Which, if it were that simple in real life, we wouldn't need petroleum. Sadly, that's a figment of my imagination. And so were these sharks that were blocking my way in front of the generator. After restoring order to the storm drains, Lito Lee told me that there were portal pieces scattered across this long stretch of dirty pipes and disco-inspired tiles. I gathered all the pieces because I needed them to gain access to the secrets of the moon. Secrets such as, what type of cheese is the moon made of? and who is the man on the moon and the silver spoon. I went back to Lidoli with the stones and was informed it wasn't all of them. Two pieces lied in the hands, paws, tentacles, or flippers of Celestian war veterans. Their war had dated 84 years, but it was time to end this feud and unlock the secrets I sought for so long. I talked with each of them to reconcile their differences. For some reason, the only way to do so was to pick trash off the ground to make into a necklace. Now I see why people make seashell necklaces at the beach. I presented the gift to one of the war veterans, but suddenly his PTSD flashbacks kicked in and attacked me. He did not listen to reason, so the only way to get through to him was by critical blunt force trauma. Unfortunately, between the both of them, they only had one piece. 
but on the flip side, Lido Lee knew where the last piece of the stone could be. I met with one of the worshippers of the Deep Sea Cultists and was told that it was offered up as a token to a legendary creature. A token of what? To, to be servants? Anyways, to get into the palace, I needed to collect artifacts which were only held by the Deep Sea Cultists and the Muscular Blobfish. Things were beginning to look up for me, until I met the legendary sea creature known as the Deep Sea Purple Smurf. One that rivals even the Loch Ness Monster. This was probably one of the most difficult battles in this world that I've had. Not only does 90% of his attacks critical, it kept spamming attacks left and right. It also doesn't help that even if my Dinozord has resistances, the Sea Smurf here straight up tears right through it. After multiple attempts of experimentation and the case of fizzles, I was able to finish it off with my fire-breathing mechazord. With stone pieces in hand, I went to the portal cube to get them repaired. Before I explored the inner machinations of the moon, I went shopping for some vacation attire at a decent affordable price that doesn't break the bank. Although this gear looks worn out, I think it fits in with the Celestian mobs. On top of it all, it gives me some much needed resistances to actually take a few hits before I morphed into something. Out of money and out of my mind, it was time to head on in. As it turns out, the secrets of the moon is just a robot scrapyard where all malfunctioned machines go to decay and rust over time, as evidenced by their imitation crab walk. Also, for some reason I'm underwater now. I'm not sure how the Celestians lived or breathe for that matter. Inside the junk heap, I fought through various mangled robots and some lost souls who drowned to death because of their own stupidity. Unlike most ghosts that push objects around, these can actually harm you, and in my case, they did just that. After I came back from Davy Jones' locker, I sent them through the sea floor where they belonged and made my way to the main building. Inside, the robots and drunken sellers were fighting each other for a woman known as Morgrim of Celestia. Even through death, this mini-war raged on as the dead sailors still think they have a shot. I interrupted the fighting between the two sides and took on the head of the robots. For the most part, it was kinda easy except for the fact that they kept setting up their special rainbow-colored shield. I tried multiple combinations of spells until I eventually used vengeance for that spectrum of colors they put me through. It came down to the wire and there was only one thing I could do, which was not fuck up because if I fizzled, I would have died and gone through underwater hell again. The final strike was enough to knock some sense into the robots and the dead sailors. I was given a token of the robot leader's appreciation in the form of a preschool toy block. I installed the block onto a bigger block and knew I was two-thirds of the way to acing my puzzle-solving exam. The next stop was to help the nerds over at the science field. The scientists have made revolutionary breakthroughs in robot technology providing paralyzed fish with cyber-enhanced mech armor, now with legs. This eventually backfired and would turn out to be a disaster as the fish decided to control and conquer the weak scientists. You know what they say, you give a dog a bone, it's gonna bite you in the ass. Throughout the world, I kept getting this totality gear, and you know what, they got a typo on here. It's not Celestian totality, it's backpack totality. Because my backpack was littered with this shit. It took some time to get everything back in order, such as gathering jars of bath water, turning on lights to scare away wild sea roaches, and most importantly, teach the fish a lesson in respect. After numerous lessons were taught to the fish, I discovered the leader of the operations. It was none other than the mischievous magma dump. For all that gold armor he had on, it was all for show and not glitter. It didn't matter much as he had no Midas touch. Although, he did receive a special kind of touch. A tail slap to the face. Luckily for me, he also had the sun portal stone. With everything fixed in this area, I headed back to see what kind of sun-based secrets were in store for me. Now, I don't know why it says explore beyond the solarium portal in solarium, because first, how the fuck am I supposed to do that? And second, this isn't the solarium, this is an old crab. Apparently, somehow I ended up in the Crab Empire, where a feud between the sharks and lobotomites are taking place. Caught in the crossfire of the crabs themselves, hoping to restore their mess of an underwater cavern, and to welcome strangers to their hovel. Norbit told me about his life story and how his friends abandoned him. 
He then asked me to go beat up some sharks and lobotomites to make him feel better about his current situation. I taught them the value of friendship through the only way I knew how, tough love, or in this case, pain. Norbit told me that it wasn't enough to satisfy his sadistic desires and that I needed to do it again. The first step in quelling the feud was to take out the lobotomite leader, named Nuncio. This called for the big guns, to give an extra special ass beating. It was time for my humunculus diamond head to perform a second lobotomy. The defeat of the leader had gained me the ability to talk to a small dapper frog and a long-eyed crab. They explained that I was their only hope to save their broken relationship triangle. After collecting more garbage off the ground and eating it for some reason, I met with the real leader of the lobotomites, known as Glaucoma. He also had his sidekick, Barnacle Kid. Together, they formed an unstoppable brainless duo. A real battle for the ages unfolded as they combined their attacks in a relentless onslaught. Also shields, because why not just add to the challenge of trying to do this alone? I had no patience for their mind checkers, so I obliterated the leader straight off the bat. The sidekick was left defenseless and tried to piss me off even more. This was where my Thundercats morph came in extremely handy through the long fight. Ultimately, the mini servant's defenses proved futile as Heat Blast lit him up. Next, I gathered some intel out of the sharks again, as the only way to have peace is through fighting. That is why in movies, it teaches us how to make friends. The sharks informed me of some old men with Alzheimer's at the old folks resting cavern. I went over there to extract more information the only way I knew how. Before I could lay the smack down again, the administrator of the nursing home said I'd have to do various tasks to gain their trust. I was more than happy to oblige if it meant I can get out of this underwater prison sooner because spending this much time underwater will make you delirious. One of the things I had to get was a compass from a local shark gang leader. Why not just use a normal compass? Because, plot. I didn't know the gang leader was gonna invite his whole squad to roll in, or rather roll me over. So this took about 40 minutes to strike a deal with him. We eventually settled on a fair and equitable deal that was suitable for both of us. He gets a ball of fire to the face, and I get my lost time back. Everybody won in that situation. I tested my metal against the head of the old folks home, and to be honest, it went great, just as I expected. I had proven my trustworthiness and was ready to tackle the leader of the sharks. I confronted the leader and he said something about creating a new sense or fragrance for wizards. It's good that sharks aspire to be something when they grow up, though sometimes you gotta be realistic and sadly be the ones to shatter their dreams, like how my mighty morphin dreams were. Although my Thundercat doesn't do much damage, he can at least mend my wounds a little before I put the hurt on the shark leader. With one swipe from the fire down his sword, he fell down to his knees and a realization sunk in, that he could not become what he set out to be. His defeat brought me another sunstone, which we already had installed on the portal before, but whatever, I can jam it in there again, I guess. I decided to take a break from exploring and took up various jobs to make ends meet. You see, as I've said before, saving the Spyro doesn't pay much, nor does it guarantee health benefits for my potion fix and trading card collection. Some jobs included working for Uber Eats, picking up somebody's choke collar from the shop, manufacturing shitty necklaces, and killing stuff for the underground mole people. This netted me a mediocre amount of gold, but at the very least, I got some experience out of it. With the gold, I was able to afford a much needed upgrade to my armor. Not that I could really use it besides the resistance, but it looks better than my hobo attire. Fully prepared for the journey ahead of me, I talked to Edith and was finally off to see the sun with my very own eyes. I had ascended to a higher plane, a man who has seen the sun without the need to protect their eyes. One could only imagine such power. My time in splendor though was cut short as there were intruders who thought they could take this power away from me. I took care of the sharks and continued exploring the area. Unfortunately, as it turns out, I was not the first explorer to step foot in the Sun Sanctum. I went deeper and found a shark infestation. After I dealt with the sharks again, who seemed to have never learned their lesson nor heard about my past encounters with them, I was informed by them that they were led by a mysterious woman. Nearing the end of my nice view, I was suddenly blocked by Big Salami and a creepy old banshee lady named Morgrim. 
Get the fuck out of the way, I'm trying to watch the planets in orbit. I moved them away by force and received another sunstone. Also, Morgrim tried to curse me with her rap spell. The bars weren't fire enough though, so she left with her tail between her legs. I shoved the sunstone installation disc into the Celestian CD drive and booted up the so-called Trial of Spheres. Inside, the first star creature opened my third eye to see what the real secrets of the sun, star, and moon school were. It was clear as day. You gotta cheat and use pocket sand. It all made sense now. This is what made those schools powerful. Now this is really the only boss that pushed me to my limits. Not only does this dude have minions, he has a shield that can't be removed until the minions died. On top of all this, those minions can debuff and hit you. As an added bonus, they can't even respond. This ain't even an infomercial. So this was where I had to have a second hand. It is practically impossible to do this yourself with all the card advantage your opponent gets. As much as I didn't like this, this was the only exception to save a mind-numbing two and a half hours of this. The moon boss was relatively easy since they kept getting charmed by my humunculus diamond head. Love really does transcend all. Finally, I made it to the inner sun atop the stars. Here I confronted the sun goddess who used storm-based attacks. I took advantage of this and morphed into the most powerful creature the Earth and Celestia have seen, Pollution Man. He became too powerful for Earth, so now he came for the sun. I conquered the trials and became a friend to the friendless. Also saving Celestia from hearing Morgrim's bad rap song, I can't forget about that. Returning back to Frog the Jam, he tells me to stay cautious of Morgrim in the future. Don't worry, I'll keep track of her mixtape in the future. Alrighty, I know it was long, but I hope you made it the whole way through and enjoyed this video. This took quite a bit of time just due to how many areas there are. Anyways, if you are new, subscribing is just a click away, but other than that, take care and I'll see you guys.